Welcome to Lesson 8 in the C-Sharp from Start to Finish course. My name is Tim Corey, and today we're going to look at our SQL database design. Originally, I had planned to go into logic design directly and assume that you understood where the data came from. But after thinking that over, I decided that we should at least look at the design and structure of a database and then go from there. You could consider this a bonus video since it's not really about the C-Sharp project, but it is kind of important to understand if you're going to build this on your own. Now, if you aren't familiar with SQL, this video isn't going to be a comprehensive overview. I'm actually developing a start to finish series on Microsoft SQL databases that should be out shortly if it's not already. Instead, today I'm going to walk you through some of the basics on how I built this database. Everything is scripted out. So if you purchase the upgrade for the course, you'll get all the scripts along with the items in the package. So let's jump right into our diagram. Before we get started in the lesson, I want to remind you to subscribe to this channel. If you are subscribed, click the little bell icon and make sure you're getting the alerts when I add a new video. And while you check on that, could you also give this video a like? I know that we're just getting started, but liking a video is a simple way that you can make this course more popular, and that helps everyone. It increases the visibility of my videos on YouTube, which generates more income for me. It helps others out because they get introduced to this valuable content, and it helps you out because I'm able to produce more free videos. Okay, so let's get back to the lesson. So here we have our database diagram, and it looks a little complex, but don't worry, it's not that complex. What this is, is just showing us how all the different tables relate to each other. And I bring this up not to scare you away or to just confuse you, but instead I want to point out a couple of things. Again, I'm not teaching you all about SQL today. I'm just giving you an overview. But I do want you to understand how this is designed and how you really should be thinking about a design for a database. So for example, let's look at the team members right here in the middle. Notice that this is going to be a list of all the members for a given team. But you don't see a person here, first name, last name, all the rest. You see a person ID. And that links back to the people table with this ID. And notice the link right here. This is a one-to-many relationship. And so in the people table, first name, last name, email address, and cell phone number are all listed as columns. So you could have a person in the people table with an ID of one. And you could reference that person more than one time in the team members table. The benefit of that is the same person could be on more than one team. For example, if there's two different tournaments going on at the same time, it makes sense that the same person is on two different teams. Or if a tournament has closed or ended and the next tournament has started, you wouldn't want to recreate that person, but instead just use the same person and add them to the next team. So the idea here with our design is that we don't store a whole bunch of information that gets duplicated. Duplicates are really bad in a database environment. And the reason why is because if you have a duplicate record, chances are you'll update it in one place but not the other. And then you have conflicting information and which one's right and you're not sure. Because if my first name was Tim and last name was Corey and my email address was Tim at Corey.com, but then somewhere else in the database, it said Tim Corey, Corey at Tim.com, which one's right? It's, it's hard to see. And so this, this setup right here tries to minimize duplicate information by always using IDs instead of the actual person or actual object. So just note, whenever we try and store information, we try and store it in as tight a formation as possible, meaning we don't uh, have as more columns we need to. For example, if I were to say, you know what, we're going to have at least one, but maybe five email addresses for people. 
I wouldn't add four more columns for email address two, email address three, email address four, and so on. Instead, I would then create a new table over here called email addresses. And then I'd have a column for person ID, which would be this right here, and then a column for the email address. And that way one person could have one email address or five. But in this case, I say, you know what? We're only gonna capture one email address and one cell phone number, and that's it. So therefore it makes sense to put them here so we don't make our database design more complicated than it has to be. And that's the balance we always play with when we're developing a database design. So this is it. This is our database design. It's It should hold all the information we need. So we have the tournament information, the prizes, the entries, the teams, the matchups, the matchup entries, the team members. That should be basically what we need for our entire database. But, you know, especially when you're designing these things, uh, not really on the fly, but you're designing as you go. Usually you forget something. And so I'm actually building this course in a way that takes you through those kind of decisions. So that when we get down the road, you might find out, oops, we didn't include something. How do you put that in? Because that's real world. The real world is you never get something fully planned out before you have to put it in, into code. And so how do you take those modifications after the fact and put them into place? And so we'll do that with this database as well. Now let's turn it over to the SQL Server Management Studio. And that's here right now. Okay, so this is the SQL Server Management Studio for Microsoft SQL Server 2016 Developer Edition. Now what I love about this is the Developer Edition is free. You can go to Microsoft site and download it. But yet the developer edition has all the same power as Microsoft's enterprise edition SQL server. Now enterprise edition is really expensive for a developer or, or a single person to buy, but we don't need to put anything in a production because that's the one limitation this database has is we can't use it in production, but for development purposes, it's free to use. So if you were in a corporate environment, you could develop in this and then push the changes to your quote unquote real production server without an issue. In this case, we just need something for testing and for developing our application. And this will work just great. If you're not familiar, over here on the left, I've connected to my instance of SQL Server. You can actually have more than one instance of SQL Server on your machine at any one point. In fact, this right here is the dot slash SQL 2016 instance, which means that it's not the primary or default instance on my machine. Typically the default is just the dot. And so this is actually the named SQL 2016 instance on this machine. And the reason why is because I also have an instance for all of my work development, which of course I don't want to give away to the world. So. In here, I have one database, the Worldwide Importers Database. That's actually from Microsoft. They give you a sample database to play with, and you can download that by Googling it, Worldwide Importers Sample Database. But today, we're actually gonna create our own database. Now, there are a couple ways of doing that. First, you can right-click on Databases and say New Database. And it brings up this dialog. It has a whole bunch of options here. But here's what I find, especially for a development machine. You don't need to deal with all of this stuff, okay? Now, you could just fill a name here. So if you wanted to, if I typed in tournaments and hit OK, that would use the defaults for everything. Now, there is here, this is the actual data file. And so you can set some defaults here, like the initial size, how large it will grow at what size and to what maximum size and then where that's located on the disk. Now if you're actual DBA you'd want to change this path location because you want to get the most speed you can out of your disks and so typically what you do is you would put your data file 
this right here, the data file, on one drive, and then your log file on a different drive. Now, we're not gonna do that today. We're not gonna worry about any of those kind of defaults because this is just for development, not for production use. Now, that's one way of doing it. You just hit OK, and you're done. But I'm gonna show you a different way. If you go to a new query, this right here is the query window, and it's the place where you should probably spend most of your time as a uh, an entry level or, or even through advanced SQL developer. I find that it's much, much quicker just to do things here than it is to try and mess around the GUIs for most things. And I'll show you an exception in just a minute. So to create a database, you simply say, and I'll tab down here, and I'll say create database tournaments. Now notice the semicolon at the end. That's one of the newer things in SQL Server. And by newer, I mean, I believe it came in uh, around 2008, maybe. Um, so newer as in eight years ago, probably. But um, it's something that is usually left off by C developers just because uh, we forget it. Uh, but it really should be added to the end of every statement, not the end of every line, the end of every statement. So create database tournaments. And if I hit execute, I have, that says command completed successfully. This message window down here is where you see the results when you have results. You come back over here, you don't see the database yet, but if you hit the refresh button when you're on databases, it now shows the tournaments database. And if you open that up, you'll see database diagrams, tables, views, and all the rest. And if you open up tables, there's nothing in there. That's because it's a blank database. Let's go ahead and change that. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to run all of my table scripts, since running scripts is really boring, um, but then I'll come back and show you how to create a table, and then also how to create a table script. I'll be right back. And I'm back. Okay, so I've created now all the tables using my script that I will need for this database. Now let's take a peek at one of them just to see how a table is constructed. And then I'll build a sample table for you just to show you the process that I go through. So let's look at prizes. I'm gonna right click and go to design. And the nice thing about the design view is it shows us a an editor for editing our tables instead of having just the the SQL script. The SQL script can be a bit daunting. In fact, let's go ahead and look at the SQL script for this prizes. There's a SQL script. That's a lot of script. Okay. And even remembering just this part, which is all we really need to worry about, this up here is nice, but not necessary necessarily but even just this much is a little intimidating, especially when you're a C-sharp developer, not a SQL developer. Because C-sharp developers have to do some database work usually, but that's not our primary love. And so if we can get away from this, if at all possible, we probably want to. And that's where this designer comes in. This designer really makes things easy. So what I have here is my ID column. This is the column names right here. And so let me see if I can zoom in on that for you. There we go. So here's our column names. So my ID column, which I call ID, and that's a standard that I have. You don't have to have that, I, that standard, but I call it ID and then anywhere else, I typically call it prizes ID. So that's an integer column. That's the data type. So these right here are data types. And that's what you're familiar with when it comes to SQL. It's just they're named a bit differently. So my ID column is first. It's a type int. It does not allow nulls, meaning you have to put a value in there. And then this key right here indicates that's the primary key. And the way you mark that as a primary key is over here, you'll see this little key icon and you click that to add, or in this case, remove 
the primary key from that column. And what a primary key does is it says, this is what we're going to order all the rows by. And why this is important is it allows SQL to optimize the database or optimize the table. If we don't have this, SQL does what's called a heap. And it's basically just what it sounds like. It just throws rows on top of the heap. But then every time we want to look for a row, it has to go sorting through that heap as if it was a garbage dump. Now, this is a key that we create. And in fact, this column right here, ID, I set as an auto incrementing column. If we zoom out here and come down here, I'll pull this up and down here in the identity specification for this column, we have, yes, it is an identity and the identity increment and seed. The increment is how many we count up by. So in this case, one. And the seed is the starting number. So the very first item is going to be number one. And the next one will be two, and then three, and then four. Which makes sense. We're just going to count up. But what that does is it gives us a unique identifier for every row in our table that SQL will sort by. That also means when we add a new row to our table, it knows immediately to add it to the bottom of our table because it has the highest number. You see, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes when it comes to a table and how it stores information. And we want to make sure that we optimize our tables for most efficient storage and retrieval. And this seems to be the best way of doing that, creating this ID. Now, there will be obscure edge cases where that's not the case, but, and here's the deal, you're a C-sharp developer, probably. If you are, and you're building databases, it's not because you need to build the most totally optimized database on the planet. You need to build a good, really good database. And this is the way of doing it. If you have your SQL developer friends say, hey, you know, this is a much better way of doing it, which there isn't a much better way, but maybe a, a little better way of doing it, tell them, great, go ahead and build one. But this is the way that gets you the 98% of the way towards optimized for about 2% of the effort. So go ahead and do that. Um, the next thing is the place number. Again, it's an integer. That's our, for our prize, the first place, second place, third place, but just the number. So one, two, three, four. Again, we don't allow nulls. The place name. Now, this is a little bit interesting here. And I want to point this out for a minute. This is where you put the place text. So first place, F-I-R-S-T space P-L-A-C-E, first place. So we need to have a text field of some kind. In C sharp, that'd be a string field, real simple. But in SQL, where it's all about data, we have to optimize for what type of string do we want. Now, there's a few different string types in SQL. There's nvarchar, nvarch, well, that's nvarchar max. There's varchar, we're down here. And it's other types as well. But in our case, I have chosen n varchar. And the reason for that is because this is the type that best fits my data. Now, what an n varchar is, it has three distinct parts right here the n, the var, and the char. So let's start with char first. Char means a character. So this stores characters, meaning any kind of character you want. Uh, numbers, letters, special characters, they all fit in here, spaces. Var means a variable length, meaning this number right here, 50, is the maximum number of characters that this column will hold. But var means that it could hold three characters 
five characters or 50 characters. Now it can't hold 51, but it can hold 50, 49, one, or even zero characters. That's the variable means. The counterpart to that, it does not have the var there. It's just n char or char. And what that does is it says, we'll always have 50 characters, whatever that maximum number here is. And so how it gets away with that is if you store, say, a string of five characters, it's going to pad that string with spaces afterwards. So it's going to have the five characters you gave it plus 45 spaces. All right. And there are times when that's useful, but typically I find that it's not useful, again, for about 95% of the times when I want to store text. So I always default to varchar or nvarchar. And that brings us to this n. The difference between varchar and nvarchar is the type of characters it can store. A varchar, without the n front, can store just the typical ASCII characters. But the nvarchar stores Unicode characters. Now Unicode takes up twice as much storage space in your database, but the benefit of it is that it allows for other languages characters. Now I'm in the US, I typically deal with US English characters. And so if I were dealing with just US characters, I would do varchar for practically everything. But if you are dealing with an international audience, or you're dealing with the, I, the option to have international characters for certain things, you want to have this n varchar. And so that's the difference. You'll see me use both kinds in this database. And that's because of whether I thought that I would be providing the strings or the end user is providing the strings and what type of strings they are. So that's the decision to make because it does, again, double your storage capacity or storage space taken up by this data. And when you're getting into millions of rows, storage space is important. Again, we probably won't get a million rows in this project, but you know what? You want to plan for as optimized as possible right up front. Best practices. Okay, so we can change this number here if you want to up to, I believe, 4,000. But it's also the option here of nvarchar max. And that's a bit different. Max will hold a ton of data. It's actually handled a bit differently than the nvarchar because that max data is not actually stored with your row. Now when you access it and use it in the database, it's connected and it doesn't look like it's any different. But in the back end, it's actually stored a little bit differently in order to allow for some optimizations. And that the max field will be for when you're going to allow the user to type a book, I mean, lots of information or other types of data. One of the places I use that is if I'm storing a JSON string in my database to be used in my friend web application, I'll usually do an nvarchar max. That way I can store a very, very large JSON string without a problem. Okay, we have the prize amount. Now, just like C sharp, where we have the decimal versus the double, in SQL, we have that same differentiation. So the prize amount is dollars and cents if you're in uh, the US and probably something similar or um, at least as similar as far as the, the actual numbers is concerned in other places in the world. So we have what's called a money column. And that is that precise column, that uh, decimal type in, in C sharp is probably the closest equivalent. But then down here, I have the prize percentage, which is just a percentage. Um, think a number between zero and one. So, you know, 0 0.28, 0 0.83, whatever. Therefore, that is a float. And that's the equivalent of a double 
in C sharp. So that's a table. That's how you create it. Um, there's a few more things to look at. The biggest thing is the relationships. So back on the diagram, we saw that the tables were all kind of connected to each other based off of these ID numbers. And in fact, if you remember back in the diagram, or if you have the companion booklet, you can back and flip back to it. Um, we have this ID field right here, the prizes ID connected to the tournament prizes table. And how we do that? Well, right up here, I know it's kind of small, but let's zoom in here. This icon right here, it says relationships. Now, if you're dealing with a previous version of a SQL Server Management Studio, you'll see the icons are a bit different. Um, in fact, this used to be a yellow icon. Um, it might still be. Nope, it's not. So it used, to be, it used to be a yellow icon, but it's not anymore. And this is a little bit different. But if you mouse over it, it says relationships. It's the same one. So we're looking for relationships here. And we get this. This is our relationships editor. So what we do here is we say these two tables are connected. In this case, we have one relationship. We have the prize ID to tournament prizes table relationship. And if I come over here to tables and column specifications and click the ellipsis. All right. The foreign key table is the tournament prizes and the column is prize ID. The primary key table is the prizes table and the column is ID. Now that's again, terminology is, is sometimes difficult to get through, but think of it this way. The primary table is the one that actually has the quote unquote real ID. That's the ID we just created that says this is the unique row. Okay. Think of it as row number five. How does that relate to, to the tournament prizes table? Well, in the tournament prizes table, there may be more than one entry that has five for the prize ID. So therefore the tournament prizes table is the foreign table. So primary is the one that has it just as ID. That's the primary table. The foreign table is the one that uses that ID. So what this does is it links these two columns together and says, okay, these two columns are related. They're the same data. So when I say five over here, I mean the record over here in prizes that has an ID of five. Now you can get into some really fun relationships. I didn't in this database, but what you could say is enforce replication. And you can say what happens when an insert or update happens. So I could say if I delete an entry, what happens? I can cascade that delete. And so what that'll do is it'll keep my two tables in sync. For example, if I delete a prize, then I shouldn't have that prize ID used anywhere. And so I can replicate then, go ahead and delete all the records where five was used. Or I could set them to null or default. And the same thing with update, I could update the information here. So for example, if I were to change the ID in the prizes table, it would then update everywhere it said five, it would now have a new number, which don't change your IDs. Let's just get down to the, the bare facts here. Don't change your IDs. Think of them as unchangeable. Okay, so that's relationships. Tell you what, let's go ahead and close this out and create a new sample table. Again, we could do the create table right here like that and keep going, but that's really complex and not something you need to worry about. Instead, right click on table, say new table, and then just start filling it out. So I start with ID. I apologize, this is so small. 
not much I can do with this editor right now. So I say ID and then I choose int for the type and uncheck this allow nulls and come over here to the set primary key button to add that as a primary key and then expand down here the identity specifications. I double click on the no of is identity. Saying that to yes also changes these two to the default values of one and one, which is exactly what I want. So that's good. Now let's let's create a table that stores I don't know uh, person information. So let's create a first name. No spaces in the column names. Don't do that. Just like with variable names, just don't do it. I'm going to change this to an n var char, and a person's name. Fifty is the default value. Um, there may be a time when 50 isn't long enough. I'm thinking probably not the first name, but you really don't want to have to mess with this later. So let's put it as 100. And I'll say, no, you're not allowed to have nulls. Then last name, uh, it's nvarchar. Again, for sure, 50 is not long enough for all names because don't forget uh, people hyphenate their last name. So if they had a long last name and they hyphenated it, um, you don't want to, as a database developer, be rooting for their hyphenated name to include Jones um, because it's short. Um, you want to make sure that you have enough space for them. So let's make sure you just give it 100. The nice thing about the, uh, the variable character is even though we can hold 100, if we only use five characters, then the other 95 aren't stored. So it actually makes our tables uh, a little more flexible and small. So you still want to put some limits there, but you do have the option then of, of giving a little more buffer to your, your items. All right, no to allow nulls. Let's do an email address. Again, nvarchar. This one's a little trickier because I believe the actual limit here is 2000. And that's really big, um, but I believe that's the the limit that's that's put on email addresses. The reality is no one has, or practically no one has, a two thousand character email address. But you should make sure that you have plenty of space for even extreme examples. So uh, I wouldn't do two thousand. Um, you could even have a you know something on the website or whatever application you're using, say, you know, that's just too long. Pick a different one. Use a different one. Email addresses are free or practically so. So um, we can definitely specify something shorter. Let's go with, I'll just make it 200. That seems reasonably long. And then let's add a phone number. And just like with C Sharp, this should probably be a, a, uh, a text character. Um, but in this case, I don't think we need to have the N for nvarchar. We don't need Unicode characters, probably, since they're typically numbers. And so let's just do a varchar, and we will make it a maximum of 20. Now, the phone number, maybe we don't have phone numbers for everybody or don't want to require that. So we can allow nulls for that. And then let's create another column. This column will call number of kids. And so we'll do an int. We're not going to allow nulls here, but we're going to put a default in. Now, probably my guess is that if we looked at every person in a reasonable group of people, the default number of kids would be zero because the people who, who aren't old enough, who aren't um, in a relationship or haven't been yet, um, as well as you know people who haven't had kids or whatever. So and again, this is just an example, but we want to have a default value here instead of null 
but we don't want to fill it in every time, we can put a default value right down here where it says default value or binding, and we'll set that to zero. All right, and it puts it in parens. Now it's default value when we create a new record. I'm going to add one more. the create date and there's actually a couple different dates and times and other things in here um, there is date date time and date time two and then date time offset I choose to use date time two and here's the reason why date is just the actual date not a time as well which for a create date for this row isn't good enough date time is the old standard for storing date and time date time is the new standard so use a new standard there's a reason for it and then i don't need to store the date time offset so let's store the date time two here i will uncheck the allow nulls but then down here for default value or binding i'm going to put get date time and that throws an error I want to cancel my changes it's actually get date there we go get date I have a hard time switching between SQL and C sharp sometimes so get date will get the system date and time for this unit so wherever the SQL server is running that's the date and time it gets. Now, if you were dealing with any kind of overlap between different time zones, it's a much better thing to do a get UTC date here. What UTC date will do is it will get the date and time with a time zone modification of zero. So that way, no matter where you are in the world, it's always the same time when it comes to relationships. So if I was using this database in California and then somebody else used a database in New York, they might have the same time, but because it's different time zones, it's actually three hours difference. And so this get UTC date would eliminate all of that and it's usually not a problem, but in case it is, that UTC will really save your butt. So just note that if you're dealing with any kind of crossing the date line where maybe you have a SQL database on the East Coast and one replicated on the West Coast and you use both of them, that would be a problem. So in that case, get UTC date. But especially for desktop applications, that's not a big deal because you're dealing with local databases usually. In that case, get date works just fine. And I'll leave get date in. Okay, so that's it. Let's go ahead and save this. And I will call this uh, test person table. So test person. And now I can say from my query editor, let's go ahead and refresh this over here. If I were to say select star from test person, notice it's going to yell at me because I don't know who that is. If I do control shift R, that should refresh my um, well, it should refresh my window. It's not. That's okay. So what we can do is close it out and open up a new query window select star from test person and now it's updated and I can hit F5 and see there's no records in my table and we'll get back to the uh, query syntax in a minute but I can also right click on my test person table I can go design if I want to look at it again or I can say select top thousand rows which will essentially give me just what I saw here 
only if there's more than a thousand rows, it only gives me the first thousand. Or we can say edit the top 200 rows. Now this works great because it shows us a new editor and we can enter stuff in right away. Let's just enter Tim, Corey, test at Corey.com. 555-1212. Let me put a dash there. Number of kids. I'll leave number of kids and create date blank. So right now it's yelling at me. I have not put anything for ID and I have not put anything for number of kids or create date. But I filled in all the other fields. So if I hit down here, it actually creates that record. And if I were to um, hit the execute SQL button by right clicking the white space and saying execute SQL. Or by coming over here to this button right here where it says execute SQL, little green uh, play button. It's going to refresh this and notice now my ID is one, my number of kids is zero, and my create date actually has a date in there. And that's great. Now, if I wanted to, I could come over here and say, two kids and I mouse off it and that works. But if I try and change this to be 15 for nothing. So the reason why is because I cannot modify the primary key when it's an auto increment field. And that's by design. There is a way to get around that, but don't just don't. Okay. So, also notice that if I were to not fill in a field where I should have, notice the first name is not filled in, it's still null. Email address is hello at world.net 555-1234. I'll leave the rest blank. If I mouse off it, it says no rows were updated. The day in row number two was not committed. And the reason why is because you cannot insert a value of null into the column first name. And so the insert has failed. Now it allows it to come back here and modify this. If I didn't want to modify, if I want to destroy the row, I can hit escape. But in this case, I'll just put uh, Jim and then mouse off it and that works. If I hit my play button here, notice it now has a three for the ID, not a two. The reason why is because we generated a two when we tried to enter the null for first name, last name of Smith. It didn't work, but it still held on to that ID number and said, nope, can't use that. Now, some of you may be saying, oh no, I need to get that back somehow. No, just leave it alone. Let it go. It's better that it's gone. You want to keep with the normal system that SQL does for auto incrementing your fields. It will not hurt anything and it will be helpful in some instances. Okay, so we've entered some rows here. A couple things to note, this editor right here edits the top 200 rows. Okay, when I said edit top 200 rows, which means that if you have 300 rows in your table, you will only see the first 200. That can be very confusing, especially if you're adding new rows and then refreshing and they disappear. They're actually there, it's just that they're below the 200 line. They're 201 or below. That can be really confusing. I've bumped into it a couple times and there are other ways of inserting and updating rows, but it comes down to manual SQL scripts. They're not as bad as it sounds, but it's a little more complex than I want to teach you today. However, one more thing I want to show you is back here, I did this select star from test person. If you're not familiar with the SQL script syntax, actually the first thing that you should be doing is thinking about where you're pulling information from. 
So what I always do is I just say select star from. And then I put my table and I'll go back and change my columns if I really want to. In this case, star means every column. Now, when you're actually creating SQL scripts and you're optimizing them for best performance and all the rest, you don't put star because there's a few reasons. I won't get into the whole list of them. Basically, a true SQL you know, developer or DBA will probably yell at you for a select star. But again, for 95% of your cases, it's probably fine. So select star is probably fine. That just gives us every row, I'm sorry, every column. And then since there's no limiters here, it'll also give us every row. Now, when I right click, it says select top 200 rows. How do you do that? Well, select top, I'm sorry, 1000. Select the top 1000 star from test person. We only have two, so it's not going to make a difference. But that would limit us if we had a million rows in this table. Whenever you're dealing with big tables, always make sure that when you're testing things out or trying th queries, limit those things down to a few hundred rows. Okay, so I just hit the execute or F5 and I got my two records back here, my ID of one and three, first name of Tim and Jim, last name of Corey and Smith, email addresses and so forth. What else can I do with this? Well, we can also do a filter. So where last name equals Corey. You notice it's single quotes, not double quotes. So single quotes around Corey. What will that do? And it gives us just the Tim Corey record. Now, if you said, well, but I'm not sure I know the full name, but I know part of the name. Not a problem. Where last name like C-O-R percent sign. And that's the wildcard character for, I don't know. We run that, get the same results because C-O-R percent sign, Corey fits in those parameters. Now, if I didn't have that percent sign there, it's not going to find anything because last name like without a percent sign, it's essentially saying equals C-O-R. So we need to use that percent sign. Also, unlike C sharp, if I were to type all lowercase C-O-R-E-Y and execute this, it still finds Corey with the uppercase C. So C sharp would not have found that because lowercase c o r r e y is not the same as uppercase c lowercase o r e y. So SQL is not dependent on case. It's case insensitive. All right. So there is the select top 100 or 1000 star from test person where last name equals Corey. If we take that out, now, you can take it out by either deleting it or two dashes in a row makes it a comment. And I can continue on and say order by, let's do a first name. So select top 1000 star from test person, order by first name. This is skipped because it's been commented out. And there you go. If you want to add that back in, we take the comments out. And now it's going to order, but because we only have one record, we really can't see if it's ordered correctly or not, but it is. So that's the basics. If you wanted to take off a top 1000 and instead of having star, say just first name, comma, last name, those are the two columns we want. Notice the comma separation. We execute that. Notice now that we have first name and last name. And in fact, if we wanted to, we could say as first space name, as surname. What this as syntax does is allow us to rename the column. So if I execute this, now notice 
first space name and surname. It kind of blends them together, but it does say surname. So we rename our columns in our queries. That's very helpful because we can separate then the display to the user from the how we store it in the database. And so we can actually hide, obfuscate, change, or improve the names of our columns right in our queries. Now again, there's so much more I can show you here, but this isn't going to be a deep dive in a SQL. See my uh, SQL from start to finish course for that. Instead, I just want to give you an overview of the syntax because next we're going to create all of our store procedures. Now a store procedure, its job is to link together or, or expose a database script or a table script to the end user in some way. And so I use store procedures for just about all of my data access, in fact, all of my data access, because it allows me as a SQL developer to secure my database much more thoroughly and make sure that bad stuff does not get in your database. If you're familiar with SQL injection or all those type of attacks where people actually access from your front end application, they access your database and destroy stuff or change stuff or access stuff. That should probably scare you, but if you use everything through store procedures and then properly secure your database, then the, uh, the hackers have very little to no access to do anything you haven't explicitly said they can do. And I love that. And so whenever possible, I develop directly to store procedures, not to views, not to tables. So a view is like a query that's up here. I typically don't use views or at least not often. Instead, I go right to store procedures. So to create a store procedure, there's no fancy editor. Unfortunately, just right click and say new store procedure and you get this. And that's a little complicated. Now you can take the comments out if you want. Makes it a little cleaner. Um, that's just who created and when for what. But you still have this. I'm going to show you a little bit cleaner view that it's a little less scary, hopefully, and it actually has some relationship to our current tables. So let's go ahead and I'm going to add those store procedures in, and then I'll come back and I will show you how to actually look at them and even design them. Be right back. All right, I'm back. So I've created these store procedures here. There's, I think, seven of them. Let's go ahead and look at this store procedure. Right click and say modify. That's probably the easiest way of looking at it. One of the benefits of saying modify here is if I say, you know what, I need to make some changes here, I can go ahead and change this in any way and run it because it's already set for alter. And so that's the first thing I'll look at. Ignore this stuff up here. Um, and then also this right here, use tournaments, go is just saying, make sure you're in the tournaments database right up here. Because if you're in the wrong database and you add the start procedure, that's a problem. So, but we're in the tournaments database. So I call this, so alter procedure. When I first created it, I said create procedure. And that creates this procedure. Notice the red squiggly says, hey, there's already a start procedure of that name in the database. And that's because we've already created it. So if I want to change it, I have to change this to say alter. And that's all I have to do in order to then make modifications to this store procedure. I call it dbo.spprizes underscore get by tournament. So this is for the prizes table. I'm saying get the prizes by tournament. So get all the prizes for this tournament. And then this is the value I'm passing in. So I'm passing in int and I'm calling it tournament ID. Think of this as your parameter in your method in C sharp. So this is your method name. This is the parameter. This is a parameter type. So we have then the as and begin. This is begin right here and then end right here. 
everything for the store procedure has to be between these two blocks, between begin and end. Again, think of these, these as curly braces. All right, so no, no count on what that does is it doesn't send back to the caller the count of how many rows uh, occurred, and that's fine. Just set no count on just says don't send that extra bit of information unless you wanted it. If you wanted it, then you'd take that entry out or set no count off. But in most cases, I have not found this necessary to send back a count. Especially when you have a select query, a select query returns data. So if it returns 10 rows, guess how many rows were returned? What, 10? We can count. So there's no reason to have it send back two pieces of information when just one will do. And that one being our actual data. So in this one, I'm saying give me all the information from the prizes table, but then I'm joining it. And that's a little more complex. And so I'll walk you through it. Again, select, well, p dot star instead of star. Why p dot star? Well, I renamed the dbo dot prizes table to be just p. That's the rename right there. And that way it makes it shorter. So instead of saying dbo.prizes.star, I say p.star. Makes things a lot easier. Why p? Well, p for prize. And then I do the inner join. And what this does is it connects two different tables. And I'm connecting them based upon the prize table, its ID, so p.id, equals t. T is the dbo.turnitprizes renamed to t. So t.prizeid. It's just that same relationship we set up earlier. We're using it. We're saying these. this is the connection here. And then saying where t.turnitprizeid equals the ID passed in. So what's happening is I'm saying let's find out the link across these two tables and then only give me the prizes that are in this particular tournament. Now again, it's going to take a little bit to understand that and that's fine. If you're confused, don't worry. You just have to use this, not necessarily understand it yet. Down the road, if you want to understand it and if you want to do more with actually creating store procedures, which I would recommend, then go ahead and watch my course on C Sharp from start to finish. So this is our store procedure. Now, how do we call it? Well, it's a little different and there'll be a little bit different in uh, C Sharp as well. But let's create a new store procedure and then we'll call that. Since we have this, um, the test person table with sample data in it. So let's create, right click on store procedure and say, notice by the way, that is inside of the programmability folder, then store procedure. So right click and say, new store procedure. Let's get rid of all the stuff we don't need first. When I create store procs for uh, my company, I actually fill this information in or create a similar template and use it. But in this case, we don't need to do that. And then let's pass in or give it a name. So I'm going to say DBO. Now, what's DBO? Well, that's database owner. Notice that all of my tables have DBO dot. All of my store procedures have DBO dot. By default in SQL Server, DBO is your primary owner and primary schema for your tables and store procedures and, and views. You could change that. And in fact, if you use a sample from Microsoft, you'll see all kinds of different uh, schemas. Instead of DBO, it'll be person dot or address dot or company dot. That gets a little confusing. And again, for a rookie person just starting out with SQL Server, don't worry about it. Put everything in DBO. So create, start, create procedure DBO dot Let's call this, I always start SP, don't do SP underscore, 
but SP. SP underscore will confuse the system into thinking this might be a Microsoft supplied store procedure. And that's not good. It makes things uh, longer to try and figure out and it could have some um, some naming issues. So let's call it SP test person underscore get by last name. Now parameters, let's just go ahead and wipe all this out. And let's wipe out this comment as well. And we will wipe out this as well. So there's a little more bare bones. Now in the parameters here, I want to bring in one parameter and that would be last name because I'm going to get the test person by their last name. If it's more than one person with that last name, it'll bring more, more than one record back. So we will say at because all variables in a store procedure should start with at last name. We'll say space and var char one hundred. Now, if you're not sure on the the number, the how big your last name should be, you can right click on uh, test person, go to design, and say, "Yep, last name was one hundred." You could specify in your store procedure less than the maximum. If you specify more than the maximum, you'll have a problem when it comes to inserting. So, but less than is fine. Equal to is probably the best um, since it's the same limitation, but it's really up to you. So last name or at last name, space, and the type. If we had more than one, we'd put a comma here and say at say first name or whatever. But in our case, we only have one parameter being passed in. And then down here inside of our begin before our end, we will say select star from dbo dot test person. Now, do I need to do dbo dot? Technically, no. If I don't, then the system will say, I'll think it's probably dbo. And so it'll assume that and prepend it. But in this case, it's probably just a little cleaner to say dbo.testPerson, where last name equals at last name. I'll put my semicolon to be uh, complete. And we're done. That's our store procedure. I hit execute, and it says commands completed successfully. And at first, you might be thinking if you don't, if you're not, you know, if it's late or whatever, you'll think, wait, what? Why don't I see data? And you don't see data because this doesn't do data yet. What you're doing is actually creating a new store procedure. You're just creating a new entry here. If we hit refresh, you will see that test person get by last name is right there. And if we create a new query window, I can call this by saying exec exec dbo dot sp test person underscore get by last name. It's not there, so it's gonna yell at me, so I have to refresh. And that's the control shift R, so that takes a bit. And I can say Corey. Now even if the squiggly is there saying nope, didn't find it, you can still run your your query. It will still work. It's just that the editor hasn't caught up to the fact that there's new objects. That control shift R will do the refresh. It'll take a couple seconds. As you saw there, it took, I don't know, 15 seconds or so before it actually refreshed our editor. Closing and reopening also works. So I'm saying exec, that's how you execute a store procedure. The name of the store procedure, the full name, dbo.sp test person underscore get by last name. Case sensitivity is not a factor here, so it could be all lowercase if you wanted to. And then after a space, I put my parameters, and I can either put them in order or I can say 
at last name equals like so, and then comma separate in that way. I guess you should do them in order, and that seems to be fine for me. If you execute, notice it now says Tim Corey. And if we look up, I forget what the other person's name is, so you can select star from, and it's Jim Smith. So last name was Smith, and we execute that. Now Jim Smith is down here. So based upon what we select up here and run, is what we get down here. So that's how a store procedure works. Now, one thing I haven't pointed out yet in the editor window, if I have this highlighted and I hit F5, look what happens. Could not find store procedure Smith. The reason why, whatever you have highlighted in this window is what gets executed. So if I don't highlight the whole thing, then it won't run unless nothing is highlighted. If nothing is highlighted, then everything gets run. So for example, I could come down here. Let's just say select star from dbo.test person. If I can highlight anything and I hit F5, it executes the store procedure and then down below it also executes our, uh, our table, our select statement from our table. So both can execute. If I highlight just one, just that one gets executed. So that's another little tip for the editor window. So that's an overview of our database. That's really all there is to our database. I know it's a lot, but at the same time, it's not really. So I just want to give you an overview. So you saw, again, this took over an hour to kind of give you a good overview of what's going on. But I thought it was important for you to get a good handle on things before you get into actually using this. Now, I don't want you to feel uncomfortable about later going into this and just poking around, seeing what you see, trying things out. Maybe you don't get as complex as store procedures, but maybe you can create a new table, try it out, maybe even try linking two tables together. I want you to feel comfortable at least seeing this data and seeing this data coming from SQL and not being uh, concerned that it's a black box. All right, coming up next, we're going to get back to C Sharp and look at the logic for our prize form. It's a pretty simple form. We're going to see how to hook things up and we'll get into some data access and setting some of that up and continue on from there. So that's what's next. Before you go, you'll see a link on the left to buy this course. Check out the intro video on this playlist for more information about what you get if you pay. Also, if you are ever wondering what you could do to help this channel out without paying money, I've listed six things that really help. I'd appreciate it if you consider doing one or more of these. Thanks again, and don't forget to keep practicing what you learned.